Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Angelo Rocha and I'm PhD candidate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of South Florida. So the following video is a shot that was recorded at the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry ICQI 2021. This is the fourth and last video of four, four sections. So if you didn't have time yet to check it out all three other sections, go to your, our YouTube channel and check it out. So this project was organized by the editors of the book, Analyzing Interpreting Qualitative Research at the Interview, Dr. Charlie Svanover, Paul Mijas, and Johnny Saldana, and published by SAGE. In this fourth section, you will learn about performance and writing strategies after the interview. You will watch four presentations. The first one is participatory writing with Jessica Gullion from the Texas Woman University. The second one is presentation is dramatizing interviews with Johnny Saldana from the Arizona State University. The third presentation is turning transcripts into stories with Aisha Nishida from the Villa College, Steve Eric Kraus, and Haslinda Binti Abdullah and Nobaya Binti Hamad from the University of Putra, Malaysia. And the last presentation is Sophie's Choice the social act of publishing a qualitative study with Mitch Allen, a scholarly roadside service from USC, Berkeley, and Findlay's University, and Sophie Thomas from Carleton University. And your discussion, discussion today is Sage Publishing Helen Salmon. She joined us, she joined the panelists at the concluding discussion. So get comfortable and enjoy the, the section fourth. And don't forget, go back to our YouTube channel and check it out the other three sections. All right, hello everyone. My name is Jessica Gullion. I am a sociologist at Texas Women's University. My chapter in the book is called Writing for a Broad Audience, Concept Papers, Blogs, and Op-Eds. Though academics need to write for scholarly outlets, the general public has little access to those outlets and let's be honest, has little interest in reading scholarly articles. This is unfortunate because qualitative researchers have insights and recommendations that would be directly beneficial to the public. How sad if you think about it, we pour our souls into creating knowledge that an elite handful of people can access and that very few do. When I looked at some of the statistics about the readership of my own work to give you an example of what I mean, I found that ResearchGate has noted that my one of my favorite articles, The Cheerleader, A Feminist Mom, Her Preteen Daughter, and the Spaces for Girls in American Football, um, which was published in a pretty prestigious journal, it's been downloaded 43 times, um, and it has been cited twice. Over on the journal's webpage, I can see that it was accessed 233 times, so that's a little bit more encouraging. Um, but I would like people to actually read the article. Um, meanwhile, one of my books, Writing Ethnography, has been downloaded from libraries more than 12,000 times. An opinion piece that I wrote about guns on college campuses that appeared in Newsweek got hundreds of thousands of reads. So my chapter is about how to write in a variety of different venues that target the general public. This includes concept papers, persuasive briefs that are given to elected officials and other policymakers, blogs, and opinion pieces and editorials. I also talk about how to shift your writing from an academic audience to a broader one. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on editorials today. When we write for an academic audience, it's important for us to connect our work with a larger academic conversation on whatever issue we're writing about. There are scholarly lineages that a learned person should be aware of and that should be reflected in their writing. Here's the thing with writing for your, the general public. No one cares. 
Sorry, but it's true. General audiences want you to get to the point. Of course, you'll want to re reference current events or link to data that's appropriate, but the vast majority of people will not care how your research intersects with Deleuze's, and your Marxist perspective could be construed as socialist, which as we know from Fox News is a big no-no. People look for information that they can use themselves or articles that they find entertaining or interesting. They don't want to spend a lot of time reading gobbledygook. And let's be honest, how many of us don't read boring articles in detail? So the first thing to know about editorial writing is that you need to know who your audience is and what they're looking for. Get rid of all of your disciplinary jargon. Opinion pieces and editorials, which I'm going to shorten to op-ed, have a basic structure. The first sentence of an op-ed is called the lead. The lead should catch people's attention and make them want to read further. This is followed by main points with supporting evidence. For your supporting evidence, instead of including citations, insert hyperlinks into your piece. In print media, briefly explain your source, such as like according to so-and-so. For online writing, hyperlinks have a dual role of bringing readers back to your piece from other websites that you've linked. So including a lot of links can raise your number of readers. After your evidence, include a to be sure section. The to be sure is a way to cut off your detractors. It's how you signal that you already know what the counter arguments to your argument will be, and it allows you to trust them. For this chapter, a to be sure might look like this. To be sure, academics have to write for journals. Publish or perish is real. And we all have to publish in peer-reviewed venues for tenure and promotion. However, writing for a broader audience gets our work into the hands of people who can use it to improve their daily lives. Including the to be sure makes it more difficult for detractors to tear your piece apart. You can acknowledge that you've already considered and dismissed their objections. Conclude your op-ed by telling the reader what you want them to do after reading your piece. This can be anything from a call to arms or more subtly giving them a takeaway to consider. <coughs> Excuse me. There are all sorts of places for you to publish op-eds. Of course, newspapers publish them, but so do hundreds, if not thousands of different websites. You can find a place to publish your work. Like writing for a journal, you will send a query to the editor about your op-ed. Keep in mind that news moves fast, much faster than journals. Don't query an editor until you are ready to go. They will probably want to publish your piece that day. Once you've submitted your query, be on standby. You may be asked to do some immediate editing if it's accepted. Like journal publishing, don't query more than one editor at a time. That being said, if you haven't heard anything in a day or two, move on to another uh -huh. editor. Keep your pitch brief. Three or four sentences are enough. Tell the editor why this article is important, why it is important right now, and why you are the right person to write this article. Paste the completed article below your signature line. Editors look for some sort of hook to your piece. This shows why your work is relevant to their readers right now. Try to connect your work to something else that's happening in the news or popular culture. As an example, I wrote the op-ed I mentioned about guns on campus. When Texas legislatures passed a law allowing allowing students to carry concealed handguns on university campuses. I submitted it the day after the news had been saturated with stories about how university officials in Texas were in the middle of trying to address this new legislation. Even though my idea, guns and grades make uncomfortable bedfellows, could have been offered at any time, the connection with the recent news event made it more relevant to editors and readers. I'm now going to shift to another part of the chapter um, subtitled The Dark Side of Publishing for a General Audience or How I Pissed Off the NRA. 
I would be remiss if I didn't extend a caveat to publishing for the general public. When we write for academic outlets, we expect a certain level of decorum. Though some may disagree with what we write, those disagreements rarely turn into death threats, although mistakes have probably been made. Publishing for the public, however, opens you up to trolls. The scourge of public venues, trolls have the potential to cause you a lot of havoc. I speak from personal experience. When my op-ed about guns on campus went viral, the National Rifle Association saw it and posted a rebuttal on their website, along with a link to my university website. Many NRA chapters reposted the NRA rebuttal along with their own commentary on their websites. In fact, you can Google Jessica Gullion and guns and still find a lot of this. Once you've published something online, don't read the comments. You might think that the comments would be a good way to interact with people. I suggest you avoid them. If you're the type of faculty member to get upset about a student evaluation of your teaching, then you really don't want to go anywhere near the comments about your public writing because those comments can get vicious. Once you publish a piece, back away from it. Some people will use the comment section to harass writers. It's like a game to them to get arguments going, and those arguments have the potential to get pretty nasty. My op-ed got lots of comments. While many were positive, there were a lot of haters as well. Harassment doesn't stop at the comments, however. Thanks to the NRA, I received death, death threats on all my social media accounts via email, snail mail, and voicemail. Like somebody actually wrote a letter to me um, about how much they hated me and how wrong I was. Um, I also received a lot of I will rape you at gunpoint threats which only solidified my feelings about guns on campus. In addition, trolls co contacted my chair, dean, provost, chancellor, and elected officials demanding my termination. I wish I'd been more prepared for this onslaught, which is why I'm telling you about it now. I would be lying if I said it don't bother me. For a little while, it was terrifying. I temporarily turned off my social media accounts. I've changed the settings now so that I can approve comments whenever possible before they're made public. I also had a neutral person review my emails and phone messages and just delete the threats. I reported all of this to both my administration and the campus police who worked to ensure my safety. If you're going to publish something that might be controversial, have a plan in place for how you will handle the fallout. And note too that the fallout may be good. Along with the trouble I had, I also heard from a lot of faculty who were just as concerned as I was about the matter. And I got to be on national public radio. Fox News also wanted to interview me, but I declined that offer. Going viral can definitely boost your visibility, and you can move from the handful of readers of journal articles to hundreds, if not thousands or more readers. You can get your message out into the public. Just be aware that not everyone will be receptive to your message. So in conclusion, we know that most journal articles have a limited readership. While scholars debate just how limited this is, given that so much academic writing is kept behind the firewalls of journal and library websites, and that so much of the writing is dense, often impenetrable, and written for specific audiences, this should not surprise anyone. As qualitative researchers, we gather plenty of information to help us write for the general public. Once we fine tune that skill, we can see our readership grow. For those of us who do qualitative inquiry with the social justice mindset, cultivating a broad audience can go a long way towards advocating for social change. Thank you. Thank you so much. The second one, the second is with Johnny Saldana, Dramatizing Interviews. Just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, I just want to make sure that I clarify some terms for you. First of all, with ethnodrama, that's a compound word that joins ethnography and drama. So we're talking about the written play script that artistically dramatizes either for the stage or the screen, 
a research-based account of field work. So any kind of data source that you have in qualitative inquiry uh, is a good ample material for an ethnodrama. Just as we estimate that 80 to 90% of qualitative inquiry studies draw their uh, uh, data source from interviews, it's the same thing with ethnodrama, uh, except a higher percentage, almost 90 to 95% of ethnodrama scripts are adapted from interviews. Ethnodramas are not necessarily documentaries as they're conventionally labeled in video and film, but uh, you will find a lot of different terms for this, including things like docudrama, nonfiction playwriting, and ethnographic performance text. Now, the other term, ethnotheater, this refers to the specific production and staging of your ethnodramatic play script. You're utilizing all the conventions of live theater or media, everything from costumes to editing. And as far as its staging goes, it can range all the way from reader's theater, where actors are seated reading aloud from a script, to a completely formally mounted production with as much theatricality as you can even see on a Broadway stage. Again, Lots of terms for this particular one, but some of the ones that you'll hear most frequently are documentary theater, performance ethnography, and verbatim theater. When we think about the purpose of dramatizing an interview transcript for the stage or for the screen, do some reflection, first of all, on why you're doing it in the first place. If you're doing it just for novelty or to be you know, creative, you're probably doing it for the wrong reason. I feel that when you need an artistic rendering of a participant's experiences, you choose theatrical dramatization because it will present the most credible, vivid, and persuasive representation of the research, all right? It also offers you as the researcher a more intriguing way to approach the analysis and the interpretation of the data. But I think the most important reason is that it prioritizes the participant's voice. Uh, the researcher does not, to be, uh, does not need to be on stage with the participant. For as far as I'm concerned, most often the researcher is off stage because the participant can speak for him or herself. Here's a brief example, the beginning of an interview transcript of, uh, uh, there was a series of interviews of people with COPD, which stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, here, the question was asked, what medications are you taking for COPD? I'm on Untecolast, the Dolera, the gray thing. What's it called? Spiriva and the ProAir Rescue Inhaler. And if it matters, I sleep with a CPAP machine, but that was long before I was diagnosed with COPD. How are the medications working for you? Okay, I guess my condition's constant, but at least it's not getting worse. What's constant? A shortness of breath, sometimes climbing upstairs and sometimes just bending over to pick something up. There's a mild tightness in my chest. I have to take some deep breaths now and then to catch my breath. Sometimes I feel tired all day, but I think that's more my sleep than the COPD. I had a bout recently with atelectasis, I think it's called, and I had to go on antibiotics for that for, for a few weeks. Had x-rays, it cleared up, no problems since then. How has COPD affected your daily life? I'm not exercising as much as I should, but not because of the COPD, but just because I tend to sit around a lot. I do notice that when I go outside, sometimes my breathing gets more labored. So I guess that's stuff in the air that's affecting me. I try to stay indoors as much as possible. It hasn't really debilitated me in any way, but I know I'm not going to be running marathons. So has there, like right now, there's a slight tightness in this part of my chest. It's not painful. It's just noticeable. And I don't have as much air power as I used to have for speaking. My breath sometimes runs out at the end of a sentence. I have to breathe a little more air in to speak. Now, if you can imagine that interview uh, being said in a kind of a, uh, an airy kind of like, not rich voice, but something in which you heard kind of like a breathy kind of voice. So that's just the beginning of a transcript. It continues on where uh, he talks about some of the other things that he has to do with his COPD. 
So what a qualitative researcher or an ethnodramatist now has to think about are several things. First of all, even before the interview starts, if you know by chance that you are going to be collecting data for purposes of dramatization for the stage, just like you would with any other qualitative study, of course, you have to have that written permission with your IRBs. However, this time, make sure that the language in your document specifies that it may be adapted for scripted performance. That way they know that their work will be public, all right? We also work just as we do with qualitative data analysis with condensing the narrative. Just because you have a one hour interview doesn't mean you have to dramatize for the stage the entire one hour. There could be just perhaps maybe five minutes out of that excerpt which hold real strong dramatization potential, or perhaps maybe bits and pieces throughout the interview that you can just simply condense for purposes of dramatization. A third thing to think about is whether you're going to present the work verbatim exactly as it was spoken, or whether you're going to adapt it. Sometimes a verbatim speech, of course, gives us the wonderful rhythms and what Anna Devere Smith calls the organic poetry of a participant. However, theater needs to concern itself with an economy of time. Sometimes we don't need all the extraneous details. And so perhaps rearranging or giving uh, the participants original words, some aesthetic shape might be in better order. Give careful thought to the beginnings and endings of the ethnodrama, because uh, in theater and playwriting, we always say that think very carefully about how your work is going to start and how it's going to end. And most often the journey in between will take care of itself. Even though we are dealing with real people when we dramatize their stories, we do, if you will, create a character. We transform the real into a kind of a semi-fictional kind of rendering. And so we think about, just as we do with uh, fictional characters, what is the participant's objectives? What do they want? What problems are they facing? What kinds of emotions might be embedded in what they're talking about in their interviews? For the ethnodrama, you may want to consider whether a poetic format rather than a prosaic rendering, as we would in drama, be more appropriate. Because when we put our participants' language into poetic form, like in stanzas and pieced lines, we think very carefully now about how the actor might interpret that differently than they would a kind of prosaic rendering. And the final thing is to think theatrically. In other words, if you're going to put this for the stage, one of the worst things to do is to put the actor behind a podium. a conference presentation is not theater. And so what you need to do is to think about all the devices of theater at your disposal, lighting, costuming, scenic pieces, properties, and so forth, because that's what gives that sense of vividness to the performance piece. So now that you've considered all of those aspects, now what we think about is how are we going to dramatize it? So here's just one example of the beginning of the dramatized piece of William's monologue. I decided to title it, I Worry, because at the end of the interview transcript, what happens is that William talks a lot about worrying about having to go on an oxygen tank. He worries about his longevity. And so that's where the title came from, is that at the end of the piece, he says that as a motif. Italicized stage directions are a convention of the theater. And so I encourage that at the beginning and throughout, whenever you feel that you need to describe for a director what, how you envision the visual look of the production. So let me read aloud, please, as you follow along and try to image this in your uh, creative mind. Setting, a bedroom, nighttime. Beside the bed is a nightstand with an inhaler, lamp, and CPAP, continuous positive air pressure machine, with a mask and hose attached. William, a 50-ish man dressed in pajamas, enters slowly 
and out of breath. He sits on the bed, picks up an inhaler from the nightstand, shakes it, and takes a deep puff. After a pause, he takes a second deep puff and massages his chest. He speaks to the audience. When I'm having difficulty breathing, I need some relief. Like right now, there's a slight tightness in this part of my chest. It's not painful, it's just noticeable. I used to be a smoker. I don't have as much air power as I used to for speaking. My breath sometimes runs out at the end of a sentence and I have to breathe a little more air in to speak. I have to take some deep breaths now and then to catch my breath, climbing upstairs, sometimes just bending over to pick something up. I do notice that when I go outside, my breathing gets more labored. That stuff in the air affecting me. I try to stay indoors as much as possible. I feel tired all day. I'm not exercising as much as I should. I just tend to sit around a lot. I'm not going to be running marathons. Sits on the bed, picks up a CPAP mask. So that's just an example of how the beginning of a monologue might occur. As the monologue continues, he tells you the story about his breathing. And the end of the monologue, he lays down going to sleep with the CPAP mask on him. And what we hear in the darkness is that breathing and that uh, air pressure that a CPAP machine makes. So some final recommendations. Remember that a play script is not a journal article. I love it when uh, scholars attempt to dramatize their work, but get out of that mindset that it has to be journal-like. There are no footnotes. There are no citations of the academic literature in plays. Let the participant speak for him or herself. Also, remember that theater's primary goal is to entertain. And when I say entertain, I mean in two ways. It entertains ideas as it entertains its spectators. In other words, whatever you're going to dramatize has to be of some type of relevance or some type of, if you will, importance to the audience. And the final thing that I always say is stop thinking like a social scientist and start thinking like an artist. And what that means is think theatrically with anything you're going to do with qualitative work. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny, so much. Um, now we are going to hear uh, Aisha Nishida and Stephen Eric and ha Hashlinda in Nobaya from the University of Putra, Malaysia, and talking about turning transcripts into stories. My, our chapter is 23, and thank you for this opportunity. And it's about the methodological process of how to turn transcripts into stories. Before going into the discussion about the multi-method uh, restoring framework, I'd like to give a brief um, introduction, uh, a briefing about the study context, because some of the examples that will be discussed will be along with this line. So it's a study about so adolescent life skills education program experiences. It's a retrospective study. And this examples from in the chapter are from one single participant's interview scripts are used as exemplars and the purpose or the focus of it is on the reconstruction of the me meaning that the participant spoke about in her experiences while also wanted to keep the original voice of the participant. It's about the as the methodological process unfolded, I found that it was a four-phase progression for me, from starting from the point of interviewing to transcribing, and along with trying to figure out how to chronologically plot it, to co-creating and collaborating with the participant, and then in the finally making meaning from these transcripts. So it was a really a long process. And the outcome was this, the multi-method restoring framework. That is how I started working with it. And I'll explain each phase by phase in this, trying to do it at least in this 15 minutes. <laughs> so the first phase 
is about interviewing to transcript. So this is, for me, choosing the right participant was very, very in, important. And because without the right participant, there's no real experiences or real story to tell. So a story should have good experiences. So the p- participant should actually have lived that experience. And the transcribing, so after selecting the participant it, and interviewing the participant, immediately started transcribing. It was, everything was transcribed. The verbals, the non-verbals, like the small gestures, the facial expressions, all of it. Why? Because it's so important to give the real meaning to understand the full um, story behind it because most of the time the emotions are not uh, expressed. It's seen from the participant's face. With this, the it was again listening to the participant, it's audio, trans, and then reading the transcripts, familiarizing with it. And it's actually a process known as elements of holistic content reading and it's from Liblech and colleagues in 1998 so that's where I got the inspiration for it and then in phase two it's the this is where a lot of work went into a lot of thinking went in because this is the story how do I story it how do I want to present it what's this data talking about so I wanted to get immense into it. So there were so many questions, reflective questions. What's the, well, who's the main character in the story? What are the main events? When, where, and where did all this take place? So there was so many, so much of reflective, um, reflection going on and how has the participant positioned himself? And along the way, also understanding that story, every story has a beginning, a middle and an end. So it should start somewhere. What's the, usually when when participants or when we even talk, we don't start with the exact point of experiences. Along the way in the, in the transcript, we find that, okay, so this is where it actually started. So this, the backdrop of the experiences were since it's a re- retrospective, I was interested in understanding the participant's adolescence experience. At the point of interview, the participant was a young adult. So she started, it was, I found out primary schooling, and then from there onwards, that's how she has started her um, describing her experiences within the program in the, uh, with the adolescence time period. So sequencing, The beginning of this story started with the primary schooling for her. That's her experience. That is where the experience is done. And there were also other important elements that was um, that was really analyzed into understanding the transcripts. It's the story dimensions from Kurtz to 14. That's the form, function, and the phenomena of story. So the form of the uh, story dimension includes about the communicating structure between the roles of the character, the setting, and the story plot. So, what's it like, and how and where is the to- story taking place? And function of the story is about connecting and bridging the cognitive aspects of the characters, their plans, their goals, and all. And eventually understanding the emotions that's manifested within the social context of what the participant is talking about. And as I was reading and as we were analyzing, there were also another story. So a story within story, it's like not just one whole incident was described, but these stories within this within the story that was to, that the participant was describing. It also it's not necessarily about the experience of life skills, but it did shape the participant's life skills experience because this was a story that was so um, significant for the participants. So there were some elements like that in the transcripts. 
as we analyzed, we got deeper into understanding these elements as well. Phase three is about co-creating. This is something which is very important in narrative. The co collaboration is promising when participants are safe and keeping in mind that the participant is a young adult. So the best way to communicate, get a good rapport would be through their means of communication. That's the texting we are talking about. So Viber is something similar to WhatsApp, but it's quite pop popular in the Maldives. So Viber is one platform. It's a social media platform. Then um, Facebook instant messaging and the emails were for bigger chunks and longer understanding and all these interactions. So in this process, the participant felt that she was part of it because in every step of the way, she was being asked, inquired, is this okay? So it was a very collaborative effort. And as we, as we were, as the story was unfolding, we understood that it's easier because we felt that the participants' presence in every step of the way. So this step was really, really important. And this was so crucial for us. Eventually, for meaning making, the idea was adapted from the structural analysis of Brisbane and the narrative compositions within the transcript was analyzed. And if you look at this expert is about meaning making and it was very much from the structural analysis of Riesman, the narrative, as we want to develop the story, the narrative composition was analyzed. And this, if you look at the evaluation, for example, they, they are just putting something that they feel like they are going through on me. So that, so that was something I learned when I went from primary to secondary. As we see this, we know that the participant is being evaluative of uh, friends, and the experiences that she was going through at that time. And looking at the direct speech, she was telling me that in your age, this is very common. Text, texting is very common. And we were asking, okay, why has there were so several of direct speeches used within the narratives, within the interview process as we went in, we in, analyzed the transcripts. And when we asked about it, it's like they, it was too, it was significant. These were the points that the participant felt it was very very significant for her. So these were the aspects where it was in from the direct speech perspective. Then looking at shifting pronouns, this is something which is, which is very important for us because English is not our first language. And sometimes in our conversations, we don't, we may by slip, we may use pronouns that's not appropriate or for some it could be deliberate. So what's the idea behind? Why has this all of a sudden shift? When I went to high secondary, they started telling us they are, that means the teachers telling us, so meaning the student body, the students, this is the age where you, now she is distancing herself. You will get intimate. And when asked about this particular uh, phrases, what was explained was that she didn't feel that it, even though it was the age, that's what, what she was going through. So that's why there was the distance between this, the, and then that's the shift in pronoun. So it actually helped us to understand and uh, understand where the participant was even in a, every step of her development. Let's look at talking about the self in third person. She is like in the school post, she would be a bit too full of herself. This is about her, but she's talking about her in third person because it, that's not how she identifies herself. That was something that was told about her by some of her friends. So that's how we understood all of it. And the final one, this the opinion, biases and judgments, it's about the opinions and biases helps us to understand the participant's personality in a way. How is she positioning herself? Where is her 
where is she gathering her experiences? Because usually we, opinions, biases and judgments just shape us in many ways in experience, in feeling, the things that we feel in our environment. So this was really helpful. And these were the four faces and the output when analyzed the transcript was this. So it's a story. It's not thematized. It's not chunks. It's a full story of how she experienced the mm, program. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the last one is Mitch Allen. Uh, he is going to be talk about Sophie's choice, the social act of publishing a qualitative study in Flinders and Sophie Thomas. Thomas. Uh, hi. Um, I was asked to include the article on publishing in this uh, book on wonderful book on data analysis. I've done this like a, a zillion times already. I used to run the workshops on how to get published here at the Congress for, I guess, about the first dozen years or so. And I've written a whole book about it. I've written articles about it. I've given presentations, many presentations on it. So I wanted to try to figure out a way of uh, doing what I was being asked to do without repeating myself and saying the same things I've already said a hundred times. Um, so I thought the best way of doing that would be try to find a good case, a good study that I could uh, uh, use as a way into the topic that would give a lot more detail of how that happened in, in at least one particular case. So in looking around, um, I wanted to find something that, where I had a lot of interaction with the author, a place where I've actually worked on. I, I was the publisher of Left Coast Press, I probably should mention that. Um, and that it was a, a, a database, uh, a data-driven study, so usually somebody's dissertation, and um, also written in a, a non-traditional way, sort of in this case, an arts-based project, so that it to sort of go away from the sort of normal, how do you how do you get something published? Um, after thinking about it a bit, I um, sort of invaded uh, Sophie's life, Sophie Tomas, whose dissertation uh, turned into a book called Life After Living, Leaving, which was published by Left Coast Press, of which I was the publisher um, in 2011. So I used that as the way of getting into this topic. And in fact, the most of the article, um, which I'm not going to try to repeat here, is correspondence between Sophie and myself. So I've only written about half of it. Um, she didn't have the choices of, as to what I picked and what I didn't pick. So uh, she's not listed here as a co-author. But in fact, half of what's here is, is Sophie's work and not mine. Um, also, it, was, it appeared in a book series that uh, Carolyn Ellis edited. So Carolyn's role as a series editor was also really helpful. And what I, what I tried to do is to repeat parts of the conversations on email that Sophie and I had, and then pull out the general advice about publishing that came out of those conversations to be able to put into the chapter. And um, if you want to see all that, you'll have to read the chapter, which is kind of part of the function of having this session here. Uh, even though the what I talk about is a, a book project uh, that uh, Sophie wrote and that I published for her. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the same advice would also apply in getting journals articles published. So if I want to sort of boil it all down to a single point, uh, which is what I'm going to try to do here in the time I have, is that publishing is a social act. Uh, it is not something that there's some kind of uh, abstract ways of knowing what is good, what is publishable, what should be published, what does get published. But it is, it is a, a social act that is, that is controlled by a variety of gatekeepers. Those pe people being publishers or acquisitions editors like myself or like Helen, who you'll hear from in a little bit, or journal editors, people who, uh, who, who select the articles that appear in journals. And as a, social, as a social act, it deals with all the things about humans that we all know, that uh, humans have biases, humans like other humans and dislike other humans, humans like certain ideas and over other ideas, Her, humans have preferences and lacks of preferences, and all that applies to a book publisher or to a journal editor. And so in fact, the idea or the possibility of creating a relationship between yourself and this gatekeeper is, is one of the ways in which you maximize your possibilities of getting published, which is something that every academic wants to know and needs to know, and the reason why I was being asked to, um, to participate in this volume. So you want this person who is the gatekeeper to be your friend, to be your advisor, to be your helper, rather than your judge. And most of the chapter has to do with how to go about how to go about doing that. One of the key things, though, 
that is important is that as much as you need these people for your career success, they need you just as much. A journal is not a journal without articles in it. So every journal editor is always looking for articles to publish. And the more articles they have access to, the more scholars they have access to, the more likely they are to pick the articles that they like the, the most. Same thing through, true with a book publisher. The more choices you have, the more books you know, the more books you have access to, and therefore, and as a result, the more scholars you have a chance to talk with. This is this gives you the the greatest chance of publishing the kinds of books that you're proud of, the kinds of books that you want to have published, the kind of books your publishing house wants to have, have published. So the gatekeeper is as interested in this relationship as you are, although there are far more of you than there are of them. So. Um, Try, trying to make friends of your gatekeeper is one of the is the thing that that's primary to this kind of this conversation. And also, in addition to that, it also gives you much more agency over what happens to your work rather than just you know sending a a, a uh, uh, an idea or a proposal or an article off to some uh, some some nebulous place and hoping for a response. The gatekeeper can also help you in, in a number of ways, both as serving as your editorial advisor and in some ways helping you get the thing done, because once this person is your partner in the in the process of getting something published, they become as responsible for getting this thing finished as you do. And in the conversations that Sophie and I had, the emails that Sophie and I had, a lot of things I put, picked up were the fact of my helping Sophie get things along and, and the other side of it, helping Sophie helping me uh, shape the kinds of publications I wanted to publish. Relationships are also two-sided things, and for you to suddenly show up on a publisher's doorstep saying, I want to be your best friend, uh, has this, this feeling of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, exploitation to it. So in fact, the relationship should become something that's far more than just, I want you to publish my article, or I want you to publish my book. And in fact, um, publishers are always need to things. They need advice of what should get published. They need reviewers of things they've got. They need people to be recommending other people to them. They And... And again, as humans, even a simple compliment, if some, an article comes by your way coming out of a journal and you really liked it and it's really influenced you, just writing a note to the journal editor saying, I really like that article, it really influenced my thinking, my own work, is, has enormous effect. And believe it or not, when it comes to delivering your own article to that journal editor a year later, that journal editor will remember you for, for something just like that. So with that basic principle in mind and displayed through the correspondence that Sophie and I had over a span of oh, probably two or three years, um, Sophie had lots of questions and I provided answers to her. I had some, some thoughts to her and she provided reactions to my thoughts on how she should write the manuscript. So we dealt with a whole variety of, of issues of, you know, can I publish articles for my dissertation? Can I experiment with a form or does there, is there a certain way that I have to write this? Um, how, what is the role of the intermediaries? How should I deal with the series editor? Uh, what, what, what about the reviews I get? How should I negotiate those? What format in terms of production and in marketing should I, do I have to work with? And when the marketing department of the public publisher contacts me, what do I do now? Um, I'm not going to go into all those questions because if you read the chapter, you'll get the answers to all those. Um, one of the ones we spent a lot of time on is talking about getting the right title for the piece. And again, that's something that requires a lot of thought. And the, the conversations that Sophie and I had, I think will be in, re, instructive for those of you when you when you get to that point. Yourself. So the book eventually got published in 2011 by Left Coast Press. It's called Life After Leaving. And Sophie and I, here we are a decade later, we're still chatting with each other, um, even though I haven't published her since uh, uh, since Life After Leaving. But we're still we're still regular correspondents. And even though I'm no longer in publishing, we've become friends, which I, I think is probably part of the, uh, um, the the purpose of all this. Everything else I have to say is already in the chapter, so you can read it for yourself. But what I did manage to do was convince Sophie, who, again, I was writing this as the publisher and, again, as the gatekeeper, the person with all the power in this relationship. So I asked Sophie if she would come and join me in this session and provide her perspective on what it was like, because my guess is, and we've had conversations about it, but I really don't know exactly what she's going, what she's going to say, but my guess is, is that her perception of this process of getting published was far different than my perception. So, Sophie, up to you. It's lovely to have this time with you guys. And thank you to Mitch for inviting me to join in this conversation. In order to prepare for joining you today, Mitch was kind enough to send along to me all of the records of our correspondence that he drew on as he was putting together the chapter. And reading them was like entering a time warp back to 2009. It, it's crazy how, I think, 
compounded by the pandemic. It's like reading a story about Oz or something like some magical, some history that feels so discontinuous with where we are now. But it was it was also a bit like um, these these reading about some time of, you know, when no one was worried about this and that we're dancing around the, you know, the Illini hall and, and just the lovely revisiting of a a time that was more simple in ways that are now complicated and more complicated in ways that are now simple. Because at that point I was early in my doctorate and uh, I had gone into my doctorate in order to support my kids because uh, the scholarships worked out better and allowed me to have a flexible schedule. And, and so it was a lot of very like practical, I need to be able to support my family. I need an academic career, even though it seems like not the best thing to gamble on was actually the, the, the most available option for me at that point. And so I was driven not just by the, you know, pursuit of knowledge, service to humanity, but also like food on the table, right? So, so that makes a, um, that's kind of a complicated set of motives to carry into academic publishing spaces where the aspirations are supposedly less material and, and possibly with good cause because, you know, that's, not necessarily the primary purpose of the work that we're doing, but it also is like a practical contingency if you want ever to be read, you know, that there has, someone has to pay to enable these things. So I knew that finding a publisher or somehow getting your work out was a thing that you needed to do. I didn't have any idea how to do that. I didn't know where to go. And I just happened to luck into ICQI in the second year of my PhD. And I did a workshop with Carolyn in the morning and a workshop with Laura Richardson in the afternoon. And they were and remain generous, big hearted, patient, humans and I was bold and asked a lot of questions and wasn't too shy about following people around like a puppy and they in their kindness uh, were very helpful and supportive and introduced me to Mitch and Mitch was similarly patient and uh, I think mostly because I was somewhat entertaining, <laughs> you know, was willing to, you know, because at these social events, there was a lot of competition for the ear of these folks who have a kind of yes, no gatekeeping capacity, right? And so there is kind of a, uh, the thing that came in my head was bird mating rituals, but it's clearly more dignified than that. But there's a, a, a kind of process at these social events of, you know, the aspiring writers staking out the publishers and, you know, trying to come in and make their pitches. And, and I think the best thing I can say about that process is try to approach it with a bit of a sense of humor, right? <laughs> that, that it, it's, it, it's not really um, as high stakes as it seems at the time, really, like what's gonna happen will happen. And I don't think any of the things that I stressed out over actually were, you know, essential to the, the path that ended up opening to me. It was, and this is sort of a good thing and a bad thing. It seemed mostly serendipitous. And except the only sort of constant was that if I hadn't been, you know, inquisitive and curious and verbal and sweet natured, when I engaged with Carolyn and Laurel, they would have been unlikely to introduce me to their friend, right? Because the, the, the thing that determines the quality of uh, the work produced is usually the quality of the relationships within it. And so no matter how good your work is, I doubt Mitch would be willing to bring in someone who was, you know, super unpredictable or had, you know, obvious kind of relational red flags that I was going to be a pain in the ass to work with, you know, that would have been, uh, I think I would have had to be way more brilliant if I was more of a pain in the ass, right? You know, that there's kind of a, a, an all over balance that you have to achieve. And similarly for the publisher, right? Like, um, I had to 
trust Carolyn and Mitch to make input on stories that were absolutely, you know, cutting right close to the quick of stuff that I was working on personally and academically at the same time, because I think a lot of grad students go back to school because that's the only way to get mental health benefits, at least in Canada. So, you know, graduate education becomes a proxy and support for sorting out your shit, right? Um, which can lead to a lot of writing problems, actually, because then it's not reader centered, right? Then it's not oriented around the needs of the reader. It's oriented around whatever the mission is, you know, the thing I'm here to solve. And so that pivot can be something that takes um, a broadening of perspective. And I think I was lucky because I'd written for radio before, I'd written plays before, I'd written poetry before, I'd, I'd had, you know, I'd done, I'd written for the newspapers and magazines, just all little things, never with any great success or ambition, but enough that I understood some breadth of genre. Now, um, it was also lovely to read these things and reflect on how little has changed with Carol and, and Mitch and their constant support and uh, friendship really to me, which I think is a testament to their character because it shows that there's like, it's not a fickle, you know, I'll fly by night. Oh yeah, you've got something I could sell. I'll, you know, it, that there was a kind of um, consideration and then investment in, in not just the book, but in the author. And it's a relational investment, right? That, that's not just about the publishing house or the bottom line or the book, but it's about, um, I have felt like their investment was in trying to like polish the jewel that could be my work, right? That, that it was a, a kind of interest in adding to the world that is, I would say altruistic to a large degree in that what they love most is the, the, the sort of fizzy, interesting bits that you can add to this conversation through, you know, bringing these little voices online and seeing what they'll do to the mix. Um, the, the things, it was interesting when I was reading it through because I thought about all this stuff about security and needing to trust the folks that you're working with. And realizing that trust is not the same as agreeing and that sometimes time is your best editor, especially if your publisher sees something in your work that you can't see yet, you know, and sometimes like often what I would trust them for was that if they felt there was a friction, there was a problem, there was a, a deficit somewhere, I absolutely trusted that they were right, that there was something there that needed my attention. They didn't always know what the solution needed to be. But that was fine because then we could discuss, right? So, so that seemed like a really um, mutually respectful sort of division of scope of, of like responsibility. Um, and I socially had to like, if they were doing work to make, to show that they were trustworthy, I also had to show that I was trustworthy by following through if I said I was gonna send them something, you know, following up with a thank you card if they did, or an email if they did something for me, like just the basic reliable uh, things that our moms tried sometimes in vain to teach us, like that kind of be a pleasant person and to work with those things. And if you can't, because of course my life exploded several times in the course of this process, just stay in touch, right? Like, like don't let the shame of having missed a deadline keep me from being like, oh God, Mitch, you know, the, this time the house burned down, whatever, right? Like they get it, um, just try not to hide because you're embarrassed because actually everybody is just sort of making it up. It's not like there's some grade of, you know, professional folks who have their shit together who never sob over their revisions, right? Like I, at least I don't see this disappearing anytime soon. So I'm assuming that it's, the things that we agonize over are mostly just normal stuff writers have to go through. The last thing, if I have a couple minutes left, I have no idea how I'm doing for time. Um, but I teach research methods and my brain is like the Zamboni of order. It just sort of has to, you know, it's like a raccoon fiddles with things. I just am a pattern making machine. So as I was reading through these emails that from our correspondence, of course, I'm sort of coding them in the back of my mind. Right, And after a while, I noticed that all of my codes were self-critical for this correspondence. I saw a consistent minimizing of neediness, 
you know, so I, you know, was depressed. I called this a problem of morale with a smiley face beside it, right? Um, or I, you know, he was talking about how my parents would feel about this uh, contentious piece. And I was like, oh, my role in the family drama, blah, 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 you know, very much making it like a uh, technical problem that I've solved rather than in engaging in the actual sort of backstage uh, emotional reality of the dilemma that is still unresolved around that for me. Um, and there was a lot of affirmation seeking through all of my correspondence with him. You know, in, in many, many times I could see, you know, sort of inviting him to do that emotional labor of patting me on the head again and saying, it's okay, you can do this, you know, and, and never, not in the sort of condescending, probably the back would have been better, but, but just that sort of, and it really reminds me that when we go to write, when we go to school, it's like everything for since your primary education comes with you, right? Like all, all of your experiences in school are invoked whenever you sit down to write again. And so there was a kind of reassurance to the neurotic child in me that still has a pretty loud voice that Mitch kind of very patiently would <laughs> dole out on a semi-regular basis. <clears throat> and I guess the place that I would leave that is just that the security management can be a big chunk of the work. And especially when you're working with folks who have histories of trauma, the signaling around security management can get very complicated, right? And people can become dissociative or triggered or not really understand themselves really how they're exercising agency because of the nature of the trust injuries that a lot of folks can carry into their work. And so there's a real need to perception check, um, consult, um, trust yourself uh, and be open uh, with yourself, first of all, and then really trying to be clear about the separation of the significance of this interaction, the object around this particular, whatever it is with the text and your value as a human being, the use of your career, you know, whether or not you're neurotic, all of these sort of larger things can get tangled up in the social relationship with your publisher, but they don't actually help improve the publication. Right? And, and so the extent to which you can, um, the extent to which I could not bother Mitch with stuff that was out of his wheelhouse, I thought was was important that I, you know, I didn't try to make him my therapist and my mom and my partner and my all these things, right? That, but that required me being able to recognize the team that I needed <clears throat> to get through it, right? And I guess the last thing, <clears throat> pardon me, that I would say, like so many of us who work in this, field is really that I would not be a professor at this point if Mitch hadn't decided that it was worth his time to listen to my spiel and have a glass of wine on the grass and then say oh, okay you know maybe sure you know and and his willingness to do that not just for me but for dozens and dozens of you know overly earnest, over tightly wound, super intense, using too many words, you know, scholars, and, and to just sort of hold space for us to calm down enough that we could gain the confidence to put our thoughts in a clear line and think about the other that we're writing to and connect it somehow with the machine that is the book industry, right? It's, it is one of the great gifts of my life that I was uh, put in Mitch's path. And I think that everyone in this room is, is also lucky to have their little pinch of Mitch Allen in their life now, because I think that it, to me, it kind of felt like you got to play fairy godmother. And I am sure that that's not the whole story, but that was a blessing when I needed it.
And so the main punchline I want to say is thank you. Thank you. I think now we, with Helen Salmon is our discuss. Hi. Well, I will be as quick as I can so that we can get some kind of questions in too. Um, so I'm Helen Salmon and I'm the editor of this book at Sage. Um, so I had a few thoughts on each of our four pieces. Um, so Jessica, I think, addresses a perennial um, issue that researchers face. Um, and one that I guess in the age of sort of misinformation is, is more important than ever. You're kind of passionate about your research. That's why you do it. And yet it must be heartbreaking, you know, to find your piece downloaded just 43 times from ResearchGate and 200 times from the publisher's journal site. Um, so how to write the findings of your qualitative research for venues that the general public um, actually reads is such an important topic at this time. And social science research has such important things to contribute. So we need to get beyond the scholarly journal. And Jessica shows how knowing who your audience is and tailoring your writing accordingly is really key. And I kind of know that a little bit from experience as a textbook publisher, because a lot of new authors, um, first time authors struggle a little bit to take themselves out of that journal writing mode that they've gotten used to and how they've been trained to write and to think of a new audience, which in textbook publishing is the student. And it's a different skill than writing a journal article. So Jessica reminds us to ask ourselves about what is the audience's motivation for reading your work? What are they looking for? Um, she recommended avoiding jargon, which is a very good point. And she talked about using storytelling techniques um, in communicating your results. Um, and I'm sure that there are many folks here who don't feel that they are journalists. Um, and approaching a local or regional publication with an op-ed piece might seem quite daunting. Um, so I was going to ask Jessica uh, in a little bit to comment a little bit more about how to pitch your idea. How did your piece get accepted at the first outlet you approached? Um, how do you recognize a topic that is likely to be newsworthy? And we were all terribly shocked to hear about the, the threats and the trolls and all that that accompanied you, but that seems to be such great advice to kind of, you know, think about what, what, a, what, a, what could happen as a result of that kind of publishing. And I agree with her, her chapter that um, blogs are a great way to build an audience for your work. They're a great way to actually um, promote some of the journal article publishing that you do. Um, it's just another way of, of getting that out there. It helps you build an audience for your work. Um, and I think Twitter is a great mechanism too, because you know you you uh, tweet that article that you just published, and then somebody else retweets it, and it, it just kind of gets magnified. It's a great great uh, avenue too. So Johnny's uh, presentation, dramatizing interviews or ethnodrama, has a number of advantages. He showed us, and in the chapter he writes that a performative approach of a high aesthetic quality has the potential to engage us emotionally and communally through real time kind of theatrical immersion. And he also writes that dramatizing the interview transcript script into a monologic uh, form helps the qualitative researcher uh, in a more intriguing way to actually approach the analysis of that data. Um, in the book chapter, he breaks down the process, and he did today, into various kind of key steps that were important to consider when doing this type of work. He recommends we let the participants speak for themselves, make it entertain, and then stop thinking, I like this bit, stop thinking like a social scientist and more like an artist. And I guess I have a similar question for Johnny in a minute. Um, that I had for Jessica in doing a journalistic piece. So for a researcher who wasn't maybe so lucky to go through theater education training, um, 
how would you go about doing something like this for the first time? And also, can you talk a little bit about the various outlets that there might be for either publishing this work or, or actually performing an ethnodrama? Um, turning to Aisha, um, transcripts, turning transcripts into stories and keeping the participants' original voice. You had a really great kind of process that you outlined, which I thought was very helpful. Who were the main characters in the story? You um, had us keep in mind what are the main events? Where and when did the events take place? How has the participant positioned themselves in the story? I was kind of impressed by the, the methods in this chapter that you had developed. Um, involving at one point kind of going back to the participants after the first part of your analysis uh, for kind of follow-up interviews as part of what you called a kind of co-creating of the narrative. Um, I guess my question for you is what about, uh, is about kind of what particular logistical or other challenges you might find with doing this type of work, particularly if you're kind of going back to participants. Um, I also wondered if there could be a tendency for the researcher to kind of write their own story and then somehow <laughs> look for data and participants that would fit that kind of narrative. Um, and then turning to Mitch and Sophie, yes, publishing is definitely a, a social act and I can relate to that. And it's something that I have missed greatly in these last 14 months of no travel and no conferences and no meetings face to face. Um, so I think your chapter provides uh, a really vivid example of how to do, how data-driven work like Sophie's dissertation can be turned into a different project in this space, in this case, a sort of arts-based theoretical project um, about the interactions between the two of you over a good kind of couple of years to bring it to fruition. And then the relationship that had developed, but even at the end of Mitch's chapter, leads to a discussion about a potential second book. And I can relate to that. I'm lucky enough to develop, have developed great working relationships with authors and indeed some great friendships. And there's nothing so gratifying as when an author comes back to you with that idea for book number two or book number three. So I'd love to ask Sophie what she learned from the process um, and what were the key takeaways? What might you have done differently in that, um, in that whole kind of process from thinking about the germ of an idea to seeing the book um, in come to fruition? I think there was, um, there was some, logistical challenges around the publishing, oddly enough, because I got an award, but then the award was supposed to come with a publishing contract and a thing that Mitch also did, but it was a different series than what Carolyn edited. And, and it was like this complicated thing to figure out what was actually like what way I should go with it. And I think one of the things that made that super stressful for me was it felt like the stakes were super high. You know, it felt like this was a make or break decision for my career. And, you know, accepting the one meant that I had to like fly across the country to go accept this thing and that I needed money for it. Like it was, it, the logistical hurdles seemed like they were just non-negotiable. I had to like turn my life inside out in order to make sure that I didn't miss every single opportunity for affirmation because otherwise, you know, I was just going to, be consigned to oblivion forever period right and and I think that made me feel like I had less agency than I really did you know that that I didn't have enough confidence to be able to say you know if Mitch thinks this is great then probably you know someone else will if I need to or you know probably it means that I don't need to um pick up every opportunity to get that affirmation that what I'm doing is fine 
which really is no replacement ever for the sort of gradual process of coming to have confidence in your own voice as an author, which is a really tough thing to do because it feels like in a way, because I'm not the reader, it's like I have to speak without hearing myself in a way. Like I can't really know how I'm read by anyone other than, right? Because I just, it's like how you hear your voice through bone conduction, right? I don't really know how it sounds. And so that's where the the not wearing Mitch out piece of it becomes a little complicated too, because it's, it's again, that trust piece, right? Being able to trust that if I ask for something and Mitch says it's fine, then it's fine. You know, this isn't code for your one request away from burdening me too much and being dropped from my roster, right? But the, 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 the managing of expectation and, and what, essentially what kind of love you're being offered, you know, what kind of care, what kind of guidance, what, and, and, and the, the terms of the exchange are new and not really clear, right? So like, especially because it's a social role, like I, I might know on paper what I can expect from him technically, but how much emotional support, how much like, is he, if the, the role clarity, I think is necessarily messy. And if I could give myself a memo a decade ago, it would have been roll with it. <laughs> Don't worry so much about it. Right. And, and just trust the process a little more and also trust Mitch, you know, like that a publisher is not going to fill their lives with incompetent writers just because they want to flatter them because incompetent writers, I assume are too much pain in the ass to be worth it. Right. So, so if you're going to be encouraging me to write, you know, it's probably because there's something in the writing that you like regardless of how entertaining I am over a glass of wine. Should we go back to, thank you. Should we go back to Jessica at the beginning? I'm, I'm just going to talk about, um, you mentioned like, if you, if you haven't been in journalism before, how do you go about mm. like contacting people and, and getting in that? Um, and how I'm, do you recognize something that's newsworthy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge fan of NPR. I listen mm -hmm. to it all the time. I'm one of those people who's like, hey, I heard this on NPR. Let's talk about it. And when I listen to NPR, a lot of times the people who are the guests are university professors. And the thing is, like, we are experts on something. And even though, like, in the United States, we have this whole anti-expert thing going on right now, um, we're still experts on a thing. And that is valuable to people, some people. Um, they are not going to come to you. The what I mean is like the, the journal editors and things, they don't know you. They are not going to come to you. They're not going to come across your journal article and go, oh, we should have her on NPR. I mean, they might, but it's very unlikely. You have to go to them and say, hey, I'm an expert on this. And if you want me on your show, I can I can talk about it. Or, hey, here's this this editorial I wrote because I am an expert on this. And um, as far as like the content, it's really important to link into what is either going on in the news or in the world or a holiday. Like if you want to write an article about the history of Mother's Day, you pitch it a few days before Mother's Day. Like, you know, right now there's been a lot in the news about um, the protests in Colombia. So if you were the type of person who writes about like revolution and authoritarianism and things like that, this would be the perfect time to write an editorial on that and pitch it to somebody. Does that answer your questions? Because I don't remember all of them. You can ask others if they have questions too. Thanks. Um, and then I was going to ask Aisha about the particular logistical challenges with doing this kind of uh, quite participatory sort of co-creation of narrative work. Um, it was basically keeping, because in my study for my, this is part of my PhD work. So for my study, I had two participants, but what I did was I did finish the first one and then go. So 
it was keeping an audit trail and also noting mm -hmm. everything, keeping a diary. And I was being very, very careful not to put any words into it because mm -hmm. it's going to, I mean, it's going to be like uh, losing the participant's voice. The focus is about the participant. It's not my story I'm writing. It's her experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't live in that moment. It's hers. So even though I was very familiar with the program because I had been involved in the program earlier post PhD and I knew how the program works and everything I did not want to. So it was very much of like bracketing myself and then putting it as if there was none because I had an advantage when before I left to study in Malaysia there was a time gap. So I had this advantage of losing touch with the program and then mm -hmm. coming back and talking about it. And I thought, okay, this is the time I can erase all what I had about the program. And I'm going to start again. And as if I don't know anything about it. So I kept a diary and then a duty trial. And that is why the SMS, the instant messaging was so important for me because every time that something came up, I could verify with, oh, and yes. then it was always mm -hmm. having the transcripts and keeping it. It's like day and night. I lived with it for four months until I developed and I had a good story. And after mm -hmm. that, I moved on to the other. So I hope that answered your question, Helen. Yeah, I mean, instant messaging, that's, that's amazing. No having to just make an appointment to go back and interview them again. You just... You, something's not clear and you're you're there you 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 fire off that question and you get an answer and of course the your participants were just so used to it. that's how they live their lives the instant messaging isn't it that age group yeah cool johnny i was going to ask you a little bit about how you might go about finding outlets for publishing or performing an ethnodrama one of the best ways is if you're a non-theater person is find a theater person either at your university or connected with one of your local theaters to collaborate with. There's a role called dramaturg, and the dramaturg's purpose is to try to help someone create the best play possible. So uh, I have collaborated with Charlie, who came in with a prosaic story, and we transformed that into a monologic ethnotheatrical performance. With Eric Tiemann, he and I, he tried to write a screenplay, and God love him, he's not a theater or a film person, and it was so long, and it was uh, had a lot of continuity errors, and so what I did was, okay, look, please let me just have the screenplay, let me do my dramaturgical work on it. And back and forth, we were able to collaborate and build on it. And we put together what I think is a pretty good screenplay. So always find someone uh, in theater or film who can help you uh, work through that process. As far as outlets of where to publish, um, you, uh, qualitative inquiry is very receptive to it. The International Review of Qualitative Research Cultural Studies, Critical Methodologies, the International Journal of Education and the Arts. Those are just four of the journal titles which are very receptive to ethnodramatic adaptations. Thank you for all your insights because as I'm an emerging scholar, I'm learning so much. And my last, um, do you have like an advice for who is starting now? Because I, I was watching a, a video about publishing and the the speaker was telling that I should for especially as a person of color, I should focus more in journals than in, in, in if I want to keep uh, if I want to get where I want to be uh, to publish more in in journals than in than chapters. Could you share a little bit your experience and as a more as an advice for who is starting now? So I think some of that also depends on your institution and what kind of work that they value as a, as a young scholar. So, I mean, some institutions really will say you need to get, you know, you need to get those journal articles and a certain number out 
um, as you're preparing to go for you know tenure or whatever it might be. And some institutions, that's all that they really will look at. And you may have a, a department chair who's going to discourage you from going near anything else um, that would sort of detract you from publishing your, your sort of um, your research. Um, and then other institutions I find, because I work with authors, you know, all over the US and some institutions really value um, the production of, you know, in our case, more pedagogical material. They maybe have a teaching focus at that institution. And so if somebody writes a chapter in a book or they write a short supplementary textbook, that's sometimes something that can go into that um, tenure packet. So I think it's talking to your sort of mentor and your department chair and just exploring, you know, um, when you, you know, you get that first uh, academic position, just exploring what, you know, what kind of options are op open for you. Oftentimes, the, most, most authors I work with are a little further along. They're kind of maybe associate professors or whatever. I do have a few um, a few authors who are assistant professors that are working on kind of much smaller, kind of more supplementary projects. Can I answer that question too? At my institution, I'm also the associate dean of research, and so um, for my college, and so I do all the reviews of all the faculty, and it's very important that wherever you have ended up, that you look at what the requirements are for tenure at your institution and ask your chair, your promotion and tenure committee what they're looking for, because different schools will value different things and different departments will value different things. So like at my university, um, a book chapter is wonderful. Um, right. At other places, they may want you to have a top tier journal articles. So just make sure you're really familiar with what your school wants. I actually have a question for uh, Sophie and Mitch, because I think you guys were talking about like a um, collaboration process in a sense. And then that's kind of before you finish the PhD, right? Or during that period, you're writing your dissertation. So my question was like, if I want to maybe also have the book published, like the dissertation and whatnot, um, when or uh, when should I kind of start go about doing that? Or because it sounds like it's a process, and then it doesn't kind of happen overnight, or like it doesn't happen right till towards the end. And also, I think in my institution, uh, my supervisors or the institution itself actually encourages different formats. So like you don't have to write like a five chapter thesis, which is very difficult, I think, to turn into a book. And then sometimes they would say, oh, you write this first. And then after your PhD, you, you do another whatever postdoc to write that into a book. I felt like that's just too much work and it's just not an efficient use of my time for the PhD. So that's kind of where my question, yeah. This is a very common question. And yours, is, it's it's the, the essential question for a junior scholar. How do I get started? What is, what is the plan? And having just spent my last seven or 12 or 18 years writing this book, uh, which essentially what a dissertation is, what do I do with it next? Uh, along the, the uh, advice that I, would, I generally give is start with journal articles. Uh, chapter three and chapter seven are usually great places to get Get, th get, th get things going. It gets you into the publishing world. It gets you to know the process. It gets you to know the, some of the decision makers. And to start with a couple of chapters, which are pretty much very often self-contained, is a, is a good way of doing that. Um, the, the big thing about a dissertation, though, and uh, the way I describe this usually is when you start your dissertation process, you start with what well, capital B, capital I, big idea, something large that you want to address. And over time, if you have a good dissertation committee, they make you shrink it because otherwise you'll never get done. That, that eight years will end up being 30 years. So they shrink it down to smaller and smaller and smaller pieces until it's something that's manageable. Then when you go back to wanting to publish a book out of your dissertation and you approach someone like Helen or once upon a time approached myself, they want the big question. They want a book that will sell to lots of people because you address a major issue, something really important within the society or something important that's coming out of your research. And so our job is to unwind all the winding down that your dissertation committee has done and force you to unwind it back out to the big question. There's no 
way of underestimating the amount of work that in, that entails. Because having thrown all that stuff away, because the advisor says, no, you'll never get this done if you're writing that much, to, to then go back and have to do it all over again, essentially you're writing from scratch. The ideas are there, but you're writing the whole thing from scratch again. So it's a, it's a huge amount of work. And therefore, a lot of times dissertations don't get published as dissertation. Well, they won't barely get published as dissertation because they're usually too small for a publisher. And even when they are get unwound, the amount of work involved often will detain you and delay you from the other academic goals that you have, getting articles published, getting your career moving, and so on and so forth. Because it might take you another year to unwind that narrowed down piece back to the large one, and then all the reviews and the changes and so on and so forth. So um, generally, the advice is not to try to turn your dissertation into a book for those two reasons. One, because it's something different. And secondly, because it will take, a, take you a long time to do it. What I would just quickly add to that is that the function of the dissertation is to prove your cleverness. Mm. And the function of the book is to interest the reader. And, and, and so um, it was easier for me because my dissertation was already written in the structure of a play with acts and scenes with an accompanying theory program. And so I essentially had to throw out that theory program that explained the text and integrate whatever the reader needed to know into the body of the text. So that are you guys saying that there's some in kind of inherent uh, impossibility of actually mixing the two, like to kind of impress the su like the supervisors, or also to kind of also please the audience? That's kind of tasks that cannot be overlaid. Or should not be. Not impossible. I wouldn't say should. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think it just, it, it depends on your, I think write what needs to be written, you know, yeah. you're, you write what's there and then what you need to do with it, you'll know when you need to know. Can I have, a, I know we passed the time, can I have only one more question? <laughs> I noticed that uh, uh, that's my second paper article i'm working on and i noticed that the process of ed editing is very painful <laughs> and i noticed that sometimes the we kind of the painting of the paper we kind of i felt that sometimes we lose our voice when when the editor asks us to delete those few of things that we think is important how to do how to act how to accept those things because i know that's normal and um I just sometimes I had a hard time sometimes like, okay, that that's if I want to publish, I need to follow to follow those these. So sometimes but sometimes I feel that my voice is not being there on my paper. What I lost that? I lost a little bit of my voice. Well part, part of this is in one of the points that I, I make with the, my conversations with, with Sophie is that uh, it's negotiable. Uh, again, because of the power dynamics, if the publisher says do this, do that. You're, you're the, the junior scholar automatically feels I need to do this and, or do that. But in fact, it is a negotiated order. And the, the closer that social relationship is where you feel you can talk freely with the, with the publisher that what you're, trying, what you're telling me to do, or the journal editor in some cases, what you're telling me to do sort of eviscerates my entire article. Please don't ask me to do that. Can I keep that? Very often the answer will be yes, you can. I mean, this, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a one-way thing. And the more interpersonal leverage you have because you have developed a relationship with this person who you're working for, the easier it is to do that and the easier it is to end it in for the final product and to be what you wanted as opposed to what the, what the editor has asked you to do. 25 chapters of this, an introduction, a conclusion, really good work. We had a blast doing it. We had absolutely so much fun. We learned so much. And um, so please think about getting it. We're going to be on Sage Method Space in August. We're having ideas on how to manage that. Um, so we will be doing more work for the book. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>